group to Syria. And there were certain people who were um, unhappy when they came near the grave of Muawi and so on. And I asked them that, look, look at some of his faults in his life. Are you following what he followed? Maybe some of your behaviors like his behavior, be it with your parents, be it with your relatives, be it with your friends, be it with your community. Try and do the la'an in a way that, Ya Allah, dissociate me from ever acting like these personalities, then it will be beneficial for you. Alhamdulillah, thank you very much, Father uh, Sayyid. Uh, so I'd like to just uh, return back. We'll take some more calls in a, in a moment, but I'd like to return, obviously, back to the discussion. Um, Imam Hussein has risen, uh, sorry, the, the people of Kufa have uh, got frustrated with, Imam, uh, with Yazid and with the Umayyads and have written letters. And as you mentioned, there are two types, some who are sincere Shia, or followers of Imam al-Hussein, and some who are just anti-Umayyad or anti-Yazid. Um, you mentioned that the Imam was in, uh, salam, was in Medina at the time. What exactly was he doing in Medina? And then, you know, before he makes his way. Well, Imam al-Hussein salam, obviously is, um, is in a position where he's, he's trying to, in a way, awaken the people. You know, remind them of what his role is. Um, of what the role of his grandfather was, of the message of the Qur'an, trying to tell the people that this person we have sitting on the throne in Damascus is a person who's got the most absurd behavior you can have as a caliph of the religion. Um, but the stranglehold that they have in these areas and the governors who act as puppets to them doesn't help the imam. Number two, imam expects certain companion sons, who as the brother mentioned, tabi'een and taba tabi'een and so on, he expects them to actually act like um, religious people and he begins to notice that most of them are very show a very apathetic attitude um, in, in the sense that there, there's no real want of speaking out against the injustice of the caliph of the time and he begins to recognize that while he may go towards Mecca and rally more support it's as if he's being chased from one area to another okay and um, then he, uh, Imam uh, goes towards Kufa and uh, obviously to answer the call of the people there there are some suggestions that he's done this against the advice of certain people. I mean, how do, how do you view that point? That, you know, there were people who have advised uh, Imam Hussain alayhi salam and told him, don't go, stay here. Um, I mean, is, is, that, is that the case? Was it that clear cut? Well, naturally, you know, you'd, you'd be on the lookout for anyone that you love. And the idea that you'd want to tell them that, listen, some of these personalities you know were fighting your father. Are you sure that you're trusting them? But Imam al Hussein al recognizes that unless there's a sacrifice being made right now, this religion will finish. Mm. There has to be a sacrifice which has to be made. And the sacrifice is unerring, as in Charles Dickens says that if Imam al Hussein went out for a worldly desire, then it beggars the question why would he take his wife and his children and his sisters alongside him? It stands to reason that he went out for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Charles Dickens here is making a point that this man recognized that the religion had reached a stage where unless someone sacrificed all that they had, the religion was going to finish. And I remember a line where Gandhi even says that it is my faith that the progress of the religion of Islam does not come in the swords of its believers, but rather came in the stand of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. That he comes forward and he says, the stand of Imam al Hussein made sure this religion progressed. That there are many who, you know, came out on the battlefield and helped. But this man's stand, there was a stand there that a person like me does not obey a man like him. Mm. There are many of you out there saying, but you know, he's not religious, we understand, but he's the Khalifa, you've got to give benefit of the doubt. No, no, no. no. A man like me, I'm the grandson of the man who bought this religion, does not obey a man like him, does not pledge allegiance to a man like him, is part of a religion which stands up against any form of injustice and any form of tyranny. And so you found that he made sure that he, even if it meant he had to die for the religion to remain alive, so be it. And that's why Iqbal, the famous poet, mentions a line in relation to this when he says, I burn like a flame in the candle of Hussein. Mm -hmm. It's as if Iqbal is saying that, you know what, that candle, I'm an Indo-Pakistani poet, for example, in the 20th century, but that candle still shines, that stand shines. You know, so you find here, people from all walks of life were affected by this stand. Mm. And you mentioned the... Uh Imam Hussain alayhi salam, understands the need of a sacrifice. So you're of the opinion that he knows that as he sets out towards Kufa that 
this is it, there's no going back, I'm going out there to sacrifice, to die, to give everything. So he's, you know, he, he knows in advance what's happening. The mentality is that if it means I have to die, I will. Mm. Yeah. So it may not necessarily be I'm that I'm definitely going to die, but if it means I have to lose my life, mm. his sincerity, then yeah. everything will be given away. Sure. I believe you have another caller. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Hello. Assalamu brother, how are you? Wa alaikum. Hello, you on air? Yeah, hi, brother Isa. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum. Um, I just like to speak to Sayyid Amar. Assalamu alaikum, Mawlana. Wa alaikum assalam, rahmatullah. It's my mood, how are you doing? Alhamdulillah, very well. Um, Mawlana, what I wanted to ask you was, obviously people have rang up and they've spoken about Karbala. Yeah. Um, but the same people that do not cry for Imam Hussain are not aware about the events after Karbala, which never really is spoken about. What, what Yazid did on, um, to, in Medina to the Medinites, which are the same Arab fathers of the Arabs who oppress us today and destroy the shrines of uh, Bibi Sayyid uh, and of the Imams. And <clears throat> I think with the TV and the media that we have today, we need to portray this and make them more aware because they'll understand what Yazid, you know, whether they love Imam Hussein or don't, will become irrelevant to them understand the personality of a person like Yazid and what he did to them, them to their families and to their, their ancestors. Thank you very much. Thank you Excellent. very much, brother. Thank you. I think Hajj Mahmoud mentions a fantastic point here about the fact that many people, when they study Yazid, they come to this conclusion that, you know what, Yazid uh, did not kill Imam al Hussein. He was in Damascus. Imam al Hussein was in Karbala. As Hajj Mahmoud says, he reflects the words of the famous historian William Muir. William Muir says that the tragedy of Karbala didn't just bring the decline of that caliphate. It brought the decline of other kingdoms as well. What that meant was that that stand of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam would later be used in terms of revolutions and other movements. Because after Karbala, Yazid, do you know what he did? He went to Medina and he went to Mecca. If you go and study Google Waqa'at al Harra until today, that incident where Yazid asked his soldiers to plunder the grave of Rasulullah and allow their dogs to urinate by his grave and rape the Muslim woman of Medina, that in the following year there were a thousand women who had given birth who were virgins. So you find that if anyone just thinks Yazid was Karbala, Yazid was the one who killed Imam al Hussein. We we'll see what Yazid done after Karbala. And then in Mecca, he ordered his soldiers to catapult the Kaaba and burn it down. But Imam al Hussein stand meant that there'd be revolutions. Because people would see the stand and they would say that, you know what, this man, Imam al Hussein was only with 70 odd, but they brought about a sense of uh, you know, energy in the people, a sense of revolution. So then you found there were later revolutions of people like al Tawabun under Sulaiman al Khuzai, mm, al Muhtar al Thaqafi, uh, Zayd ibn Ali, even the Abbasids later on, one may say, in the name of Imam al Hussein. It led. So you found that Imam al Hussein's stand was pivotal. But did Yazid stop at Karbala? No, Yazid continued after Karbala, plundering Medina and Mecca. But there were still always people around who wanted to stand against this injustice. Sure. Thank you, Zaid. Uh, I believe we have another caller. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, I think we've lost the caller. So, um, we're going back to uh, the discussion. Imam Hussain alayhi salam uh, obviously has now answered the call. He realizes that there is a need to stand up against Yazid. And even if not for the uh, Battle of Karbala, you look at the behavior and the atrocities Yazid and his soldiers have committed in Mecca and Medina as the previous caller mentioned against the uh, you know the the <laughs> ironically the first three generations you know we talk about the people from said the Taba'is and the, um, the Taba'in and etc etc and the Sahaba it was these people who were attacked by Yazid so Imam Hussein is moved towards Kufa and he's going to answer the call but how does he end up in Karbala because you know if, if we look at the map Karbala is you know it's, it's quite a distance away Yes, well, you know, uh, there was a commander of the armies of Yazid by the name of uh, Hur bin Yazid al riyahi And he's given instructions to block Imam al-Hussein from his path towards Kufa and to surround him in the area of Karbala. 
And Imam al-Hussein, when he asks the name of this area, they tell him it's this name and that name, and he has the name, for example, like Nay Noah, and he has other names until he, he hears the name Karbala. And then he re- begins to recognize the prophecy of his grandfather about a land called Karbala where you will be a martyr. That commander, Hur bin Yazid al he, of course, blocks him even from reaching the water mm-hmm. of uh, Karbala. So he's, not only is he blocked from reaching Kufa, but now in Karbala is blocked from what amenities there may be around him in Karbala. Of course, there's great irony in what happens to this commander later on. Sure. And uh, inshallah, we can even ask you uh, about that. Uh, I believe we have another caller. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Can I speak to Brother Amar Nakshwani, please? Sure, he's yes, here sir. listening to you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, assalamu alaikum, brother. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Uh, this is Maksur Sensi from Wabarford. I am the father of Akhlaq. Ah, pleasure, pleasure. How are you, Hajji? Alhamdulillah, I'm all right. Uh, then there is one small question I would like to ask you. That sure. If you could answer me that Syria being a prominent country for the, for the Muslims for 1400 years, why the Islam did not spread there so big and it did not take over the countries? There is so much Christianity influence there. Even today, there is a town called Malula and they speak Aramic and their basic Christian language and there are so many big great churches in, in Damascus and all around I have visited them. Why Islam did not spread and take over the country as a whole? Thank you very much. Was it, was it because the, the, the Umayyad governments, they wanted it as a, as a second trenches for the, for the, in case of the defeat from the moral Islam, they would join to the Christianity or was it something else? Thank, Thank you very sure. much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, um, when you look at the Umayyad Empire, their mainstay was, of course, Damascus. And that was a central uh, base for them. Um, of course, later on, you may find it spreads towards areas such as Spain. But their central base was Damascus. And from the beginning, it's very interesting to note that although they're meant to be Islamic in their, in their leadership, they always make sure they're surrounded with a great number of Christians who are in important positions. So, for example, uh, Muawiyah's chief advisor is Sarjan. Sarjan um, Rumi was a Christian, but he was the chief advisor of the Khalifa. In other words, he had, imagine you're the chief advisor of the prime minister, you're going to be well looked after in that country. Likewise, Muawiyah's wife, Maysoon al-Kilabiyya, was a Christian. Muawiyah's grandchild, um, Khalid, his doctor was Estefan al-Qadim, and Estefan al-Qadim was a Christian. Even if you were to go years later, let's say we go 50, 60, 70 odd years later, um, even 80 years later, we can go towards uh, Hisham bin Abdul Malik. Hisham bin Abdul Malik's main poet in his courtroom was a Christian poet. Some say he's called Akhtal or Al Akhtal. And that poet was the one who Zayd ibn Ali was disturbed when the poet started insulting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So you find that the Christians always had a particular position even when Islam was ruling the nation. Because at the end they also a second point is Islam doesn't come to destroy other religions. Mm-hmm. In the sense that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi even became so powerful in the Islamic state, he still allowed the Christians of Najran to continue worshipping. They had a Kaaba called Kaaba Najran. As long as they were paying the jizya, then there was no problem whatsoever in them uh, remaining within the Islamic state. So likewise, when you look at the Umayyads, you find that not only are there personal reasons why they don't want the Christians to be harmed, be it chief advisors, be it wives, husbands, poets, but also there's this uh, idea that, you know, Islamically, um, the, the non-Muslim has a particular place of worship. And, you know, John the Baptist is buried within the Umayyad palace. Now, John the Baptist for us is important and for Christians. So why not allow them to have that uh, pleasure of um, visiting the shrine of such a uh, prime personality? Of course, I can go into other issues and the idea that um, whether the Umayyads really wanted people to become Muslims because of the, of the tax laws that were present there at the time or whether they wanted them to stay non-Muslims because of the tax laws. I can go into that. But I think these two areas suffice. Either that the empires had a very sh- strong Christian influence surrounding them or that Islam as a religion allows other religions to uh, worship freely in the state. Even today, if you go to Damascus, 
you'll find that there is a healthy Christian community. Let's say in an area like Bab Tuma, there's a very healthy Christian community. And if you went to an area like Seda Zainab, there's a very healthy Shia community. And if you went to, let's say, another area like whatever, you'll...